We have been targeted, attacked, and slandered by another D&D YouTuber, Trent Monk. That's right, he made an anti-homebrew video that literally the first whole part of the video, the first couple of things he starts listing off, different homebrews, and I pretty much have made a homebrew for each one of those, except for the fog cloud thing. I was confused by that. I don't really know of any homebrew things for that with what, whatever he's talking about there. But everything else, he was targeting me. I'm pretty sure I was on his mind. He said you only needed three house rules to fix homebrews, and I got more than three words for you home brew rules <laughs> i mean like rules as in the as in they're awesome but in true dc fashion we're going to break this thing down piece by piece because there's a lot of stuff in this video that i do agree with because all kidding aside chris over at trent monk is a friend of the channel we've collaborated on multiple different things uh we've seen eye to eye on a lot of stuff and we don't see eye to eye on a lot of stuff as i'm sure that me and you have the same type of thing. All of us that play this game with all the different rules and all the different perspectives of how to run the game, much less the rules of the game, we have different perspectives and we're gonna agree on some things and disagree on others. So in the same way with a true friend of the channel, Chris, uh, I'm gonna talk about Trent Monk's video because there's a lot of stuff that was really interesting and I wanna I want to touch on. And there's some stuff that I was interested that he had this opinion on. But we'll save those spicy hot takes <laughs> For the end. At the very beginning of his video, he talks about three different reasons why people homebrew. So the first one was applied to correct a perceived problem. There's some sort of problem that people, the players, or yourself see about the game, and you have the homebrew solution to fix the perceived problem. Totally get it. That's where a lot of my homebrews come from. My little twist to that is it comes from a place where there's a bad feeling. It's not necessarily a lot of my homebrews aren't from some sort of mechanical thing. Yes, there's balance tweaks and stuff like that, but a bad feeling where everyone's like oh wow that's what the rules say okay i guess we that's the moment for me that really feels bad and sparks a lot of my homebrews and the second thing they said is that they think it would be fun like this homebrew idea might not solve a problem or not comes from solving a problem but it's like oh this would be really fun if we did this thing and then that's where a lot of come from i don't necessarily have a lot of homebrews that come from that for myself yeah i just really thought about it and not only i can't think of any homebrews that just came from a place of this will be fun, I, which sounds bad because I do feel like a lot of the homebrews I use do make the game more fun. But anyway, the third point is don't understand a rule and want to make one that they do. This was interesting to me, and there are a few of my homebrews that do fix this problem, is there's some, like the exhaustion, that's a great example, is the exhaustion system and the rules as written, it's really hard to remember off the top of your head, like what it is every single level so you should be able to list them off. So I have a full video on this channel that just takes care of exhaustion with a simple homebrew and then a more advanced homebrew. And that's what I try and do here is offer multiple different homebrews as I do with Alcanor's Almanac and my Patreon PDFs, every single resource that I give you guys I try and give y'all options, a smorgasbord to choose from. So an exhaustion system that is just minus the level of exhaustion from all of your rolls. So if you have three levels of exhaustion, it's a minus three to your roll. How simple is that? And you don't have to be as afraid to give it out, right? So that makes you know there's a lot of cool things going on there it makes the game possibly more fun because it's really clunky and really punishing if you have too much exhaustion so then you're afraid to give it out and it causes this whole dilemma but it makes the game easier and it's easier to remember so it solves a, a, a confusing rule and then you have more advanced versions if you want to get more gritty and grindy with rules so those were his three things and overall i agree that that's where a lot of homebrew rules come from so far so good so where's the disagreeing come in you can just wait just a second because we're about to th about to throw down I'm just kidding, he's a friend. Um, but the first problem he goes into, he talks about three big problems. Lots of threes going on here. The first big problem is not a lot of these rules are vetted and tested thoroughly enough, and then they create more problems than they actually were solving. So you have this one problem, you create a homebrew rule for it, and it just spawns all of this chaos. And for a lot of people that are new at homebrewing, this could be a thing. Whenever I first started homebrewing, a lot of mine, I was I caused problems I didn't even know would happen because I didn't know the game well enough, etc. So one thing, I'll go ahead and interject this in here. One thing that I think is very important when you're homebrewing any rule system for any game is truly know the game, like truly immerse yourself in whatever it is. So in this case, it's fifth edition. Truly understand fifth edition. Once I understood the rules and everything, and before I started really diving into homebrew, I went back and just checked through the rules again, making sure I understood where the games was and where the intent was and the overlapping overlying mechanics of everything where I'm probably not going to have a bunch of plus one floating modifiers that gets a little grindy. I'm probably going to do plus twos or plus fives. 
Very simple. Or advantage, disadvantage. How simple is that? And it fits perfectly within the system that you have. And it's going to be easier to remember. There's lots of other benefits that feel right whenever you're homebrewing these things. But yes, if you don't test these things, and a lot of us, I've heard Matt Colville talk about this before, about we're not game designers. We're not game designers. We're not game designers. But some of us are, and some of us could be. And I feel that myself and a lot of the stuff that I've done in the past, and including, I guess, this YouTube channel, I that's one of the strength of mine, is to be able to find these little bitty tweaks and know where to make those changes. But what I would say to you, whatever your level of homebrewing is, because it is a skill that we can all learn and get better at, is share it to the people around you, the communities that you have, the, the friends that you have at your table. Uh, I have a Discord community full of extremely creative people. My Patreon community, we have a ton of creative people that talk in all the different channels and stuff. Surround and share your stuff with people around you, and it's only going to get better. And the more sharing and the more minds you have on it, the more possible people that could test this thing and really, really vet it, including yourself. You should try out these ideas, these grand, awesome ideas you have to swirl around your head, put them down at the table, run a one shot with these homebrews, pitch them to a friend and have them run it in a one shot. A lot of the reason it's taken me so long to get Alcanor's Almanac fired up and going is I'm doing a lot of play testing on these rules and I have for the last years. I've been compiling the things I've been putting in videos over the last couple of years to just truly play these things in games and see how they feel instead of just theorizing about it. The second problem Trent Monk goes into is homebrew DMs start to just homebrew and they start to run away on a homebrew train of two many homebrew rules and then it gets overwhelming and you can't remember all those rules because there's already enough rules in Dungeons and Dragons in the first place. Okay staff we got a flag on the play. This is the first time I've thrown a penalty flag on the channel. I don't know it's just coming up with stuff at this point but this is the first part where we're going to have a little bit of a disagreement here. I do agree that too many homebrew rules is not a good thing. Uh, I could make a whole video. In fact, comment down below if you want to see this. Leave a like on this video. I want to know if you guys want to see these things. I could make a whole video on the homebrew rules that I use at my table. I have so many videos out there on homebrew rules, and that's one misconception I don't want you guys to think of, is that every single table I use all of these rules always. That would be insane, and I would never do that. I have a smorgasbord, a plethora, a buffet, as I always preach and practice, to pick and choose from what I want for my players, for the one shot, for the group, for the campaign's theme, whatever it is, you wanna be able to pick and choose from. Too many homebrews are a bad thing, and a homebrew DM starting to homebrew, and then you're just homebrewing more for the sake of homebrewing, oh my goodness, yes, that would be bad. But this is where things start to break down for me, because then he shows a picture of all of the rule books in Dungeons and & Dragons, and I don't know if this was just the stock footage that he used or if he was truly meaning that the uh, the amount of rules through all these different books. But I mean, I got a bunch of books on this back shelves back here. We all have varying amounts of books, but you're you're not using all of them simultaneously. You have Eberron and you have all these different campaign setting books and you have Ravenloft and then Curse of Stride. Like there's all these things, but a lot of these you don't, you're going to use them simultaneously. Yes, the player's handbook. Yes, the Dungeon Master's Guide. And if you want to use some optional rules from other things, sure. But even those are player options that only maybe some of your players will use. Or it's not these like giant, it's not like there's books and books and books, right? The example that was given is barbarian grapple rules. There's a barbarian that's trying to grapple somebody. And then they're like, oh, what was the rule for grapple? What was the thing? Okay, it was advantage on, oh, the size of the creature. Okay, cool. And then they had to stop and check the stuff for the rules. And then, okay, now let's keep going. And then, oh, wait, but what happens if this happened? Okay, let's check the rule again. So he gave an example that I'm sure happens before, but there's uh, there's there's two things here. One is you would have to remember the rules as written anyway. So if your homebrew replaces the rules as written, then that's not as big of a problem because it's not like you're adding on top of it. If you had some sort of travel rules and normally you would just go from point A to point B and you're good. If you have this very intricate travel system that it adds on top of the game to where you have the rules as written travel that calculates it, but then also there's a night cycles and seasons and all and whatever else you're adding into the game. Yes, that would be more complicated. That's more rules adding on top of. But if you have homebrew grapple rules, then you would just need to know those rules. And if you didn't use those rules and you wanted to grapple, you would still have to know these rules. So you can't just say that when you use homebrew rules, it's hard to remember because you would might have to go check the book. And there's plenty of examples where people say, oh, I got to check the, the actual book of the rules as written to check on what those are. So I don't see that being a very strong argument as far as the comparison of remembering rules. Now, yes, if you have complicated rules, 
then yes, of course, that's going to need to be checked in this really super realistic and, and all these different roles and checks and all this stuff from, from like 3.5 and other more complex type things. Yes, you might have to be checking up on the rules. But that's why I also said what I said about the exhaustion mechanic to where you could remember my exhaustion mechanic right now. You probably remember from when I said it earlier, whatever that level of exhaustion you have, that's what you minus from your role. How simple is that? And then there's also things about dungeon masters that can do to can completely bypass this entirely. You can have stuff written on the back of your dungeon master screen. So if you forget the, these things that are certain rules, whether it's homebrews that you're implementing and they aren't as fresh on people's minds, you maybe have a bunch of players that are veterans and they know it a certain way. So you want to put this on the back of your dungeon master screen. Oh, it's right there. And then it takes half a second and you're fine. And over time, people will just remember it, assuming it's not super clunky and weird. And as dungeon masters, in general, I would give it a tip to not be just checking the book constantly anyway. Come up with something that feels right and makes sense and move on. So this isn't wouldn't that wouldn't be a problem at my table because if there ever is some sort of like, well, actually, what would the rule say? Whether it's a rules as written rule that I follow or a homebrew rule that I follow, I'm probably not going to go and dig through anything. I don't have a homebrew tome of papers that I would even give them out anyway. I'd have to go look up through spreadsheets and stuff that there's no way I would do that at a table. I would just choose as a dungeon master what makes sense in that moment, whether it's a homebrew idea I come up with or my best bet at what the system would be, and we would just go with that. We're not gonna stop and take a time out <laughs> to go check in the book. That just slows the game down and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't feel right now. If you stick to the book and your super rules is written, then maybe you would have to that. But I think that's a problem of rules is written, not homebrew. So it, I don't see this as a problem because you would just come up with something that feels right in the moment that makes sense. The dungeon master makes a ruling and you keep going with it. Then later I could go check my spreadsheets and stuff for what that rule is supposed to say. Or if that felt bad, like I said earlier, and then I'd come up with a solution, text the group about it, and we would do that next time. Then here's a quote that he said at the end of that little excerpt that happened right after. And yeah, lots of those rules could use a tweak, but is it really worth it? Is it worth it if you create a list of house rules that become clunky to implement? Yes. Yes, sometimes it is totally, totally worth it. There are rules that I feel like are absolutely ludicrous and crazy. Certain spells working certain ways, certain mechanics of things. It just feels real bad that, to have that happen at the table and to, to feel helpless and be like, oh... I don't want to do too many homebrews because ah, yeah, that, that, that feels paralyzing. One of the things I, I, one of my biggest Dungeon Master tips that I would say is to push the limits of the game. I push the limits of your players, push the limits of yourself, push the limits of your game. That's one of the biggest things I could, I could do a whole, whole video on uh, my top three Dungeon Master tips, but is push the limits of the game. If you are constantly just passively sitting back, only following the rules as written, you aren't customizing your game. You're not playing the way that you could have the most fun playing this game. Most likely the rules as written is not the most fun settings to play your game. There are probably a settings and a certain type of twists and tweaks you can make to your game to make it more customized to you because the people that created the game, yeah, there's a select amount of people that that would be perfect for. They totally falls in line with the, their game theory or whatever feels right to them, but there's probably things that you could change. And I'm serious when I say this isn't even a plug for Alcanor's Almanac. The entire thing of this book that I am in the middle of writing and everything is this exact thing. That's why this video got me so fired up and passionate because homebrew is this thing that can solve problems. And if you view it as this thing that you have to keep at arm's length, because it could ruin your game. You gotta be careful and stuff. Yes, there are things to follow. And I make sure to talk about that in the very first part of the book about be careful with adding too many homebrew rules because a lot of these things are true. But I don't want you to take that advice too far and then be afraid to homebrew because I would much rather be a part of a game and be a part of a group that is pushing the limits of their game to find that perfect custom fit set of rules that feels the best for their table. I've said so many comments and videos talking about um, a rest system of mine that they really liked and it really fixed a lot of the problems at their table or a certain bonus level up perks. My players really like it and they get excited to level up now. Different things and some might not be good for you, but some might and you won't know till you try. So if you feel too paralyzed and is it worth it? I don't know. You should test it out, play it, and then find out that you don't want it and then you can change and always revert games. You should have a thing at your table and understanding. I have a whole video on how to implement homebrew rules at your table and there should be an understanding that you can take it away and you're trialing it out, seeing how it feels. Oh, we like this. Cool, let's keep it. Oh, we don't. Let's take it away. Okay, now here is the third problem that he talks about. There's a quote from him and then we're going to get into the three homebrews that he says he 
he does use at his game table. And then some overarching things about all this big picture, this homebrew debacle. Most house rules don't have a noticeable impact on how much fun everyone has at the table even when they're remembered and don't cause additional problems. This one feels a bit weird for me. I don't, it's gonna be hard to put my finger on exactly what I feel is wrong with this thought. And I say wrong from my perspective, all of this is from my perspective, because everything that Chris is saying here, there is an element of truth of. You should be careful with how much homebrews you put into your game, and you should be careful with the problems that they're causing. A lot of the stuff he's saying here is correct. I'm just making sure to be the homebrew devil's advocate on the other end of that spectrum to make sure that you don't go too far in one direction or the other. So his thoughts about they don't have any noticeable impact. Yeah, I would say if your homebrew rules that you add to the game, that add more complexity if they don't increase fun you should remove them you should not play with those homebrews and they should not be at your table so i would love to hear homebrews that are like this because i i i don't make those homebrews or those are, would be considered bad homebrews of course i would not use them yes but i would say every homebrew that you add to the game you have to think about is the added complexity worth the added fun? Does the added fun outweigh the added complexity? And if that answer is not a three times or more yes, then you shouldn't add that homebrew. Because if you increase the complexity and the fun goes here, I don't even know if that's worth it because the complexity it gets a little clunky and causes a lot of the things that Chris does talk about. Just like investing in money in real life. If I pay $5 and I get $5 back, I didn't get a profit. So if I spend $5 worth of complexity, I better get $15 of homebrew fun back. But my overall response as to why this feels bad is because an example that first the homebrew that popped in my head is advantage stacking. I very, very much love advantage stacking and I hate the moment at the table where player one wants to help player two do something and they want to take the help action to give them advantage and player two says oh no no i have a reckless attack barbarian or i have a, i already have a guy they already guiding bolted it so i don't need you to do this thing because i already have advantage don't help me and do what you want to do to help your teammate for some cool combo move. No, no, no. I already have the mechanic in the game that I can't have multiple of. So that feels bad to me. And that homebrew rule allowing that player to help their friend and give them an additional plus two. Every advantage is an additional plus two on top of the roll. That feels great. And not only does that feel great, even if that moment doesn't feel great at the table, even if that feels like a normal moment and you don't even recognize it. There are things that certain homebrew rules cause in games that are subconscious to the players. As a dungeon master, I purposely implement lots of different homebrew rules that cause effects to happen in my players that they might not even realize. They might start working together more collaboratively and playing together as a team and not even realize they're doing it because the mechanics that I have set out for them and the different homebrews that I implement offer that. I am a very generous DM when they try and want to, they can hold turns. And if they want to go together, the person in front of the initiative order can hold their turn and they can go together. No penalties, no sort of crazy. No, you can only hold an action. And then it takes a reaction to use that. Like, no, nope. You can just use this stuff. And I'm very free when it comes to giving out these types of things because the homers at my table endorse these more fun play styles that the players might not even realize they're doing. They hold their turn and pull off a cool combo move. They're adding on rolls to each other to stack this advantage together as a group to accomplish something they might not have been able to accomplish. A lot of these rules aren't really in your face about it and they cause a little more subtle effects to the game that do increase fun and are very simple. In fact, my biggest rant point here overall about homebrew rules is you're the dungeon master. So whenever I run games, I'm the dungeon master. So whenever something happens and I say it goes a certain way or I ask for a check, I they don't have to remember the homebrew rule. I would ask them for a check just like I would anything else. And if there's a moment that happens and there's a certain homebrew interpretation I have of the rules, then I just say this is how it's going to go. I don't have to consult a book or do anything like that. It just happens this way. So for example, if you want to implement one of the homebrews I've talked about, glancing blows, where normally armor class, if you hit their armor class, if you roll exactly their armor class, that means you hit them. So then you did. And there's this weird moment there where, okay, and players have asked, especially new players, well, do I hit or not if I hit the exact armor class? Okay, well, you do hit, you deal damage. With glancing blow, it's half damage if you hit exactly full damage above, no damage below. That seems super simple and not hard to remember. And as a dungeon master, if you want to implement that, 
your players don't have to remember that you do. <laughs> so when a player says they rolled the hit, you say, oh, that, that you hit, hit exactly. It's a glancing blow. They take half damage. So they roll for their damage and you take half damage. They didn't have to remember anything. You, you remembered it. So if you're a homebrew DM and you want to implement certain things, don't worry about it being too much on your players because a lot of that burden falls on you. And if you want to do it in the first place and the homebrew makes more sense to you in the first place, and that would be your homebrew interpretation of this moment, then it's not that bad. Know your table and know your players well enough to know how much they can handle. Maybe you don't put it on them to have to remember that thing. And if that doesn't even work, then maybe you don't use the glancing blow homebrew and just stick to the rules as written. But that's a question you should ask yourself for each individual homebrew. It should also be on the chopping block. It should be talked about in session zero, which ones you're gonna add. If you wanna add homebrews in the middle of the game, talk about it and be ready to take them out if they aren't adding more fun. Now we're getting into the three house rules that he says he uses at his game table that he's tested and vetted for years. And when he said this, I was excited when he first said, oh, Trent Monk, okay, let's see what this guy's homebrew rules are. I love seeing whenever other D&D channels have their, their like, mm, tried and tested homebrews, their favorite ones. Three, favorite top three? Whoo, I thought of a video I could do on top three. Which one would be my top three? I know what they would be. Let me know if you want to say. But this was really interesting to see. And then I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit like, wait, what? These are his homebrews? The homebrews are basically no shield spell like the shield spell is removed from the game entirely which it is a very strong spell and okay i i i see that i was that was it. i didn't see it it's coming this way the second rule is if you are wearing armor you can't cast spells unless the spells you have come from a class that granted you the ability to wear that armor i have tried saying this rule about four times now <laughs> it's hard for me to even remember it. a level spell gained through a class or from a subclass may only be cast with an armor or shield equipped if that class provided the proficiency for it then you could cast that spell talk about a complicated homebrew situation here i totally get where this is coming from and we'll talk about the overall thing here in a second but now this is just restriction on spell casting and the whole purpose is is that if you are a full-blown wizard with all these wizard spells and you take a one class dip or a feat or something and it grants you heavy armor and now you can wear heavy armor and cast spells in it okay you're min maxing the crap out of the game and you're trying to break the system and all that kind of stuff and that feels bad and weird yes i totally get that we will talk about that it's a whole thing but that's what it's trying to stop and i am going to talk about that now we'll talk about the third one here in a second but that for me is not a homebrew rule at my table again this would be a dungeon master intervention thing if a player is trying to absolutely go crazy and min max the game yes you could implement some sort of barrier homebrew to like block them from doing it and the same thing as the first the first homebrew was or the first house rule of no shield spell because players optimize and they take a one class dip in a spell caster to be able to pick up shield as a reaction and they get all this armor class because shield's so strong yes i totally get it so these house rules come from from a blocking min maxers and optimizers which is a lot of what trent monk has on his channel is how to build and optimize stuff which i get it i think that's cool i have had players like that i have one of my players is a min max optimizer cool but if i had a player that was truly trying to do that i would stop and be like all right look are you just trying to like max out and break the game in some sort of way because let's have a conversation what is the class fantasy you have for this caster do you want to be a sorcerer with a bunch of armor let's figure out a cool way to do that that's not like you purposely taking a dip in fighter or something that or taking a feat that you let's have you have your armor class be increased by the certain spell that you have going so if you have a fire spell going you gain some sort of fire shield that gains you armor class versus oh, wait no no if you have a fire shield around you you gain increased armor class versus spell attacks from other certain magical sources or if you have a wind shield swirling around you with all the elements going around you you gain increased armor class against range attacks and if you have an earth shield stones and rocks swirling around you you have increased armor class against melee attacks that seems like a much cool thing i would talk to that player give him a bonus level up perk that's a homebrew that i use and they'd have a feat and i could take that feat what feat are you wanting oh cool let's make this a really cool version of it for you that's not just you taking it for the sake of having a higher armor class because you want to wear heavy armor because you're trying to break the game and i don't mean break the game a player with a high armor class is not going to break your game they've let the players play how they want but i would try and stop that player and kind of like shake them up a little bit and be like hey 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 what about this? In the same way that if a player isn't very strong at role playing, they're very shy at role playing, I'm gonna shake them a little bit too and be like, hey, I don't literally mean <laughs> shake them at the table. But the, the tip, the DM tip, the number one DM tip I gave earlier in this video of pushing the limits of the game, 
with your homebrew rules. Push the limits of yourself with your ability to keep track of stuff. Maybe that's a homebrew rule. And pushing the limits of your players in the in this way. If they play in a certain way, maybe give them a little, to test them out and let them explore different ways to play this game that they might like. And then the third rule was to just basically give Greater Weapon Master for free to everybody. So you can have a minus five penalty to any weapon attack, one-handed to whatever, a weapon attack can minus five to gain plus 10. Now, in general, I do like the homebrew of the Greater Weapon Master fix that I've talked about in a video as well, where instead of minus five and plus 10, it is minus your proficiency bonus and plus two times your proficiency bonus. So at level, you know, level one, you're not minusing five to gain 10 damage at level one. That's crazy. You are minusing two, your proficiency bonus to gain four, double your proficiency bonus. That feels just way better just in general. And I don't have to remember that again. Perfect example. If somebody says they want to use a greater weapon master at my table, I'm like, all right, sweet. Minus two from your roll. And I, I know the rule and they don't have to. And I'm just running off my game. Now, personally, I like this rule, but it's, it seems, again, seems odd because why are you giving this to wizards and sorcerers? I, in general, would talk to the player and I usually give some sort of customized feat at level one. I have the players create. Now, this is not they're going to pick a feat and they get No, 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 no. Whenever my players create characters and they create their, they do all their stuff and they build their character, they roll for their stats, they do all their stuff. I give them a dm feat a customized just from scratch just for them cool feat that they get and if they're a super crazy min maxing maxing things out okay wow okay cool your character's probably fine i'm going to give you something flavorful and then at the same time if i have a flavor person and all they did was they picked all these things that are completely not optimal and they're picking spells based on their backstory and all these really cool things okay sweet i'm going to give you a bonus level up perk that's probably going to make you more effective in combat because those players are at the same table and they're trying to accomplish the same goal and that's going to feel and if you're like oh but the min max that's not fair and we should give that's not that, that you don't get it the min maxer at the table would probably be frustrated by an unoptimized person that's not being effective in combat and they're holding the group back and i know of course the min maxer would want this super powerful feat but that's not the point i'm trying to keep these players at the same table nice and evenly balanced so they can still play their characters the way they want so for myself here with this last little rule i would just give them this custom feat myself and if this player wants to wear a sword and a shield and have a really hard hitting attack I would give them this feat. Yeah, sure. But giving it to everybody, it would just seem weird as a, as a, as a wizard. Now there was a great point that Trent Monk made here that really to made me take a step back and it was so well, I've never seen anybody say this better than Trent Monk did right here. So here's what he said. I'm going to try and do my best shot at it. Removing options from players that might be the best and most overpowered options lead to actually more options, not less options. Now, yes, literally the number of options will go down if you take away things like the Sentinel feet and the Lucky feet and Shield or these other things we're talking about and removing these options or tweaking these options. In general, I, in, I in general as a Dungeon Master try not to remove things from the game. I hate the Lucky feet and I hate Sentinel, but I did not remove them. I have two different videos on the channel, the really quick ones about what I changed the Lucky feet and what I changed the Sentinel feet. And if you still want those feats, because that's the type of class fantasy you were in for in the first place by all means take them up you'll love them that's exactly what you wanted anyway if that's what you're going for but if you're trying to take a feat because it's absolutely broken and there's so many things in the game that give you advantages that are crazy that's not the type of reason that i want players to pick a feat for because it's just on paper the most optimal one to try and do the most optimal things in the game that's that's strange to me and here's the whole thing that trent monk said that was a really really great point is if lucky is such a great feat and why would you not take it if shield is such a great spell and why would you not take it it's the best thing to take oh my gosh if you remove that the most best the best option for that player now they have to think well if i can't take shield what do i take now the one obvious choice that you should pick and if you don't pick it then you don't you're not optimizing or whatever now you have to think about what the next best option for you is and if there's not one big glaring obvious one now you really do have a choice instead of the obvious choice that really isn't there for a choice his analogy was a, a gps directions if you're going from your house to work there is one most optimal path if you took any other path it wouldn't really make sense but if there's a block in that path you now got some options am i going to go further down then or am i going to take a different tour here it just gives you options to kind of shake up the game in some sort of way and make you think about what you want for this character but trent monk if you do watch this video i hope you enjoy this other side devil's advocate version and we've done collaborations in the past and i've loved 
loved your homebrew mind on it. I will say that Trimbook is one of the best and maybe the best that I know of, of knowing the game so well to be able to polish off and optimize things and classes and different ways to build things and different options you have to be able to create the best things you can. And it makes sense that someone's from an optimizing background would have homebrew rules that stop these extreme optimizing things. And that's a props to him is in an optimizing channel to reduce the most optimal things is a really cool thing. I would love to see what, what optimizers do. No shield spell, what do you do? What's the next most optimal? Figure that out. That's a fun little brain puzzle for you. I just want to be the advocate here in homebrew land, but I do warn you, and, and there's a lot of stuff and there's a lot of truth to what Trip Monk is saying. Don't just make homebrews for the sake of making homebrews, then you think it would be fun. Test your homebrews. Be ready to remove your homebrews. Don't have so many that it confuses your players. Know your player base well enough to know if they can handle things and how much you need to know. Have it written down on the back of your Dungeon Master screen so it doesn't slow down the game. And you don't overwhelm your players with complexities and make sure that whatever complexities are added are extremely outweighed by the fun added. And if you wanna keep adding cool homebrews to your game, check out my Patreon. I got monthly homebrew PDFs with homebrew systems that you can add or not add to your games. Uh, magic items, uh, subclasses, monsters, things that make your game prep easier, all that kind of stuff. And Alcanor's Almanac will be coming out soon. If you wanna be alerted as soon as it's released, uh, go over to my website, sign up for the newsletter. I don't send out, I'm not gonna spam you a ton of stuff. I'm only gonna let you know the big, most important stuff whenever it's happening. And until next time, Stay creative. Think outside the box. Peace.